salvation, ye saints of the Lord, he is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled, fear not, I am with thee, O peace. Have you ever stood outside when the wind was really blowing strong, when the gusts actually knocked you off balance? Welcome to Through the Bible. Today we're studying Acts chapter 2, where it describes an amazing day called Pentecost, when there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where the believers were praying. With these words, Luke describes the birth of the church, and the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and all who were praying with them. But there's more here than the beginning of the church. There are principles for living this life in the power of the Spirit of God. So we're excited to study with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, about the power in waiting, the purpose for waiting, and God's program in witnessing in his sermon, The Holy Spirit and Pentecost. Before we come to our sermon, though, let's hear some great letters from the Bible bus. All of these are from our world prayer team, by the way, and these, too, are filled with evidence of power of God at work. The first one is from Becky in Indianapolis, Indiana. Becky writes, I enjoy using the daily prayer prompts so much that the first thing I do online Monday to Friday is read and pray with Through the Bible. I lead a women's Bible study, and to begin the study each week, I share one prayer prompt from TTB. One prayer request from this year impacted me the most. A lady in Iran, a nation completely closed to regular ministry, shared how her family had every material want before her husband became unemployed. God used that trial and the Through the Bible broadcast to change their hearts. She stated that her family has little materially now, but God's peace and joy. Thank you for this encouragement to pray. And then here's another. This one's from Christine. A quick note to say thank you for keeping the Bible bus on the road. I am a homeschooling mother. After months of listening to your program with my daughter, I set the globe at the center of our kitchen table where we eat breakfast and take in the word too. Now the globe gets used almost daily as we pray our way through the year and learn our geography. The world seems a lot bigger now since we were ignorant of so many of the countries over the globe and a lot smaller as we realize we have family everywhere whom we have more in common with than not. It's a privilege and pleasure to support the program. Well, thanks, Christine. Yes, we do have family everywhere. And then this last letter is from Joe in Buda, Texas. Joe writes, Hello, Bible Bus Prayer family. This is my first year of all the many years since 1984 I've been on the Bible Bus of joining the prayer team. I regret it took me so long to join, but I'm glad the Lord kept it on my heart until I did. Being on the prayer team has helped me to keep the right perspective in such a wicked world, being bombarded with sin and evil. It's easy to lose sight of God's active hand still at work. Being on the prayer team lets me see that God is very busy changing hearts and lives, getting us ready for his kingdom before he returns to take us all home. I encourage everyone to keep on praying. No prayer in the Spirit goes unheard. Ah, that's such great encouragement. So has the Lord been teaching you anything from our time in his word? Well, why don't you write and tell us about it? The email is biblebus at ttb.org or write to Through the Bible, Box 7100. Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the encouragement from the body. We look forward to hearing about your spirit today. Open our eyes that we may see you at work. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's the Sunday sermon titled, The Holy Spirit and Pentecost, here on Through the Bible. The Holy Spirit and Pentecost. What actually happened on the day of Pentecost? If you should ask today the different denominations and different churches, you would get many answers. For there's great confusion at this particular point. And you'd be listening today to a babel of voices. I want us to look very carefully at the record and the only record that we are given 
of what actually took place on that day. And it'll be necessary for us to move back and see the preparation that was made for the day of Pentecost, because in God's plan and program, it was all important. Our Lord, after his resurrection, said to these men, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's John 20, 21 and 22. You will recall, we've mentioned this before, that he told them that you as fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, and your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him. And these men were so taken aback, they had never heard of anything like that, of the Holy Spirit being given to sinners. And so they never asked, as far as the record is concerned. But after his resurrection, in that interval from his resurrection until the day of Pentecost, he said, breathing upon them, receive the Holy Spirit. And that was merely a temporary arrangement that was never to be repeated either again, as many of these things will not bear repetition. Now, these men, therefore, were born again before the day of Pentecost. But what really happened at the day of Pentecost? I want us to examine this subject from these three different viewpoints. We find, first of all, this strange word, wait for the Holy Spirit. Second, want the Holy Spirit, and third, witness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now will you notice again verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, you've heard of me. Now, these events that lead up to the day of Pentecost are all important. For Pentecost is the Bethlehem of the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit became incarnate in a body of believers. They, those that were there that heard the message that day of the gospel for the first time, 3,000 of them were converted. They were born again, and they became the tabernacle, if you please, the temple for the Holy Spirit. Simultaneously and instantaneously, they were placed in the body of believers by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Listen to our Lord. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, in a future message, we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit separately. I do not want to tarry with that subject at all today other than to say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the thing that put them in the body of believers, the church. And that's what baptism does. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12:13. By one Spirit are ye all baptized into one body. Doesn't make any difference who you are. If you come to Christ, you're born again. The Holy Spirit identifies you, putting you into the body of believers, making you a member of the body of Christ. And you're now identified with Christ. And the church on the day of Pentecost became a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Now, that's exactly what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2.21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, the church today, believers, are the habitation of God through the Spirit. Actually, back in the Old Testament, God never did dwell in a temple. Solomon understood it. Solomon said, this house that we built, it can't contain you, for the heaven of heavens cannot contain God. 
And they understood, every instructed Israelite, God did not reside here upon this earth in a temple. For the first time in the history of the world on the day of Pentecost, because God moves into a temple, and that is into a believer who is trusted Christ. That is one of the most amazing things, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit that began on the day of Pentecost. Now, that work of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was never repeated. It wasn't repeated any more than the birth of Christ was repeated. He's born once. He doesn't have to be born again into the world. And the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and began the formation of the body of believers, taking up his residence in believers. He began a work that has never been repeated. And in that sense, Pentecost cannot be duplicated. Now, after the resurrection... Our Lord was here for 40 days in a post-resurrection ministry. It was all important. That's the reason he breathed upon them, that these men might understand the truth that he was giving to them in that day. But there was a 10-day period after his ascension and the descension of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. There were 10 days when they were here, left alone upon this earth. Now, there was therefore a brief period of waiting, and that brief period of waiting historically was never to be repeated again. You and I today do not have to wait here for the Holy Spirit. He came 1,900 years ago at the day of Pentecost. Nobody has to wait for him from that day to this. He said to them, wait in Jerusalem. And this business of waiting today, a lot of folk have got their geography mixed up. It doesn't mean on Azusa Street. It means in Jerusalem. And if you're going to wait for him, you need to go to Jerusalem to wait for him. But the geography is not important today, nor the waiting today for a repetition of Pentecost. It cannot, nor will it be repeated or reenacted again. You do not, therefore, need a tarrying service. You great many people today are waiting for some great and sensational moving of the Holy Spirit. We had a man for years when I first came here, sat down front there. He always was waiting for some great emotional experience. He's a very man with a very tender heart and a very sentimental by nature. And he was always waiting for a great experience, and he never had it, even up to his dying day. And I used to tell him, I said, you don't have to depend on experience. After all, an experience could be deceptive. You rest upon what God has said to you. But may I say to you, regardless of how you uh, attempt to interpret that day yonder, there is one thing sure that that day cannot be repeated and history bears out that it has never been repeated, not even here on Azusa Street. Uh, that movement certainly tuckered out. It didn't last. And it's very ineffectual today. And there is all sorts of movements today called revival. They're not a revival at all. A preacher up in Northern California was uh, telling me, and by the way, I spoke to a minister's group in Fresno made up of all the different stripes and shades from liberals to the fundamentalists. The only thing, the liberals wouldn't come and listen to me. I don't know why, but they didn't care about coming. Only one, I was told, showed up. But they were invited to come. And I had the privilege of talking with a fine group of ministers there and then up in the Bay Area. And one of them was telling me about visiting down here in Southern California. They always like to tell you something like this. They said they went to a certain church just to see, and uh, then they saw that program on TV afterward. And the preacher made an announcement on TV that the place was packed out. And he said, well, I was there. And he says the place wasn't half filled. And he said, I thought that was deception. So he said, I got on the telephone and I called the preacher and I said, now I've just seen your television program. And it is a, uh, was taken at the service I attended. You made the statement that the place was packed out. Now, he said, I was there. And it wasn't. 
He says, how do you explain that? The man says, you poor blind man. He says, all of those seats you thought were empty were filled with angels. <laughs> it's an attempt today to try to blow up a toy balloon and hear it explode and then call it an atomic bomb when it doesn't even make the sound of a Chinese firecracker. We are calling a great many things today by their wrong name. There is no revival going on today in the church. There is a whole lot of pumped up and trumped up sort of thing called revival. But there's no great moving of the Spirit of God in this land of ours. I am told on one or two foreign fields they are seeing a real moving of the Spirit of God. Now, my beloved, the day of Pentecost can never be repeated. But there is a waiting period in our lives before God can use us. And we need that waiting period today. That is the waiting period of preparation. Paul the Apostle had that period after his conversion. You remember the Lord Jesus had said, He's to be a witness for me before the Gentiles and before kings and rulers of this earth. But before God was willing to send him out, he prepared that man. And for two years out yonder in the desert, I think that's where the Lord taught him the epistle to the Romans. That's where God instructed this man. There had to be that period of waiting. And you'll find in his entire ministry, there was that period of waiting. And in a sense, you and I today need not rush out. We need to wait for the Holy Spirit to direct and lead us. Let me turn to one instance in the life of the Apostle Paul. He was on his second missionary journey. By that time, he was a seasoned missionary. And we find him attempting to go into Bithynia, which was settled in that day with a great population. They were having a population explosion in Bithynia, and you'd think that would be the place to go. We read in Acts 16, 6, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia, the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. He made his first attempt to go into the province of Asia, where Ephesus was the capital, great cities there. And later on, we know of seven churches that came into existence, and there must have been twice that many. Now, he could not go there. After they were come to Mysidia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Paul could not go south, he could not go north. There wasn't but one direction to go, and that was to go west. And he followed Horace Greeley's instructions, and he went west. Go west, young man, go west. And what happened was, they passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. And Paul comes to Troas, and he doesn't know where to go. He has no notion where to go. He waits upon God. And there was that period of waiting. Then we read this. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. He came to Troas. Had you met Paul the Apostle on the streets of Troas in that day? I'm confident that Paul would have said to you, had you asked him, Paul, where are you going now? He said, I don't know. Well, you mean to tell me you are God's missionary, one of the greatest missionaries, and you don't know? Well, I know a lot of young people in training that can tell you where they're going to be ten years from today. I've, I've heard them give the testimony. God's called me to go to a certain place. I don't believe a word of it. And, Paul, and God had not called this man Paul, apparently, to go to Europe when he left. He didn't know where he was going. And you'd said, Paul, do you know where you're going? No. You meet him on the street the next day, and the puzzle look is gone. said, I had a vision last night. Man of Macedonia said, come over and help us. I interpret that to mean God has called us to go to Europe. Didn't know I was going there. And so he goes to Europe, that waiting. We today are so busy attempting to... To do Christian work, we forget to wait on the Lord, to make sure whether we're doing the thing he's called us to do. Man today is rushing into space. Someone said the problem in Los Angeles 
is to get the man out the freeways to the place where he can build the rocket that'll take the man to the moon. Biggest problem is not to get him to the moon, but to get the man that's building the rocket out our freeways today. In these days of tensions, we need periods of waiting before God. We find it even today difficult to wait at the street corner when that red light says, wait. We can't even wait for the light to change today. And God uses the stop-and-go method in our lives. And he says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And there is that period in our lives where we need to wait before God for strength. Now the second, they wanted the Holy Spirit. These folk did. In verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1, I read, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. The apostles are named. And all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now there was this company that were now following his instructions and how much they knew about what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost is a matter of speculation. It's obvious that there was an air of anticipation because our Lord, right before he ascended, he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, they had a recognition of a lack of power, and they needed it to go against the pagan society of that massive Roman Empire. And they were to make a tremendous impact on the Roman Empire. But here, they're just few in number. And they're the few against the mass and the many. A small minority against the mob, if you please. They didn't have finances. They didn't have any capital at all. No church was sending them out. They didn't have any buildings in those days. The church got along nicely without buildings in the first probably hundred years of it, its existence. The church had no influence. These men had no influence or prestige at all. They were without all of these things, and most of all, they were without him. Gone. He had left them. And for ten days... These men are alone for three years. They'd kept company with him. They knew how to rest upon him. They knew how dependent they were upon him. And then there was that ten days of agonizing and waiting. He'd have told them, he'd said to them back in the upper room, yonder in that great upper room discourse in John 14, 18, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The word comfortless is the word orphanoi. We got our word orphan from that. He said, I'm not going to leave you orphan. I'm coming to you. And he says, I'm coming to you by sending the Holy Spirit. May I say to you, these folk gathered yonder in that upper room, they were waiting. He had promised to send the Holy Spirit. And they believed. They had high hopes and great expectations. And that period between the Ascension and Pentecost was never repeated again in the history of this world. They were bottled in the ten days when he'd gone. And the Holy Spirit had not come. And they were told, don't you dare venture out and say a word to anybody. And yet these men had all the facts. They've been trained by him three years. Why not get busy and take the gospel out? He said, wait. 
And they wanted the Holy Spirit, and they were waiting. Now, my beloved, there is a real sense in which every believer goes through a period of waiting and wanting. And during that period, there is the set of the sail for life, and it's fixed. It's during that period decisions are made, and habits are formed, and directions are taken. It's during that period that your entire life probably will be laid out before you. Well, how Dwight L. Moody could tell you about that period in his life. Billy Graham says he had that period in his life. I find that all of the men that God's used mightily have had that period in their life of waiting and warmth. And may I say this to you on the authority of the Word of God today, Every longing soul today who's God's child truly desires the will of God. And if that soul truly desires the will of God, he's going to be able to do it. When you and I realize our inadequacy to meet life and face it on the deck, God's going to meet us. God will meet today any anxious and sincere soul who wants to do his will. When you say that he won't, you make God a liar. He says he will. And he will. Now, what we really want most of the time is our way, and we want God to put a rubber stamp on it. But he's not in the business of rubber stamping anything. In fact, he, that's one thing God doesn't have the rubber stamp. His will must be top priority for the believer. You hear today, I had this question asked me the other day up the coast, what about the heathen who haven't heard the gospel? That is one of the questions handed in. What about the heathen who haven't heard the gospel? And then here's the illustration given to me. Suppose there is a heathen in the darkness of Africa who wants to hear the gospel, will he be lost? I said to the young man, he's a Cal student, I said, do you know of a heathen like that? He said, no, just suppose. Well, I said, there's no such thing as an illustration like that, because if there happens to be that kind of a heathen, God will move heaven and hell to get the gospel to him. He'll get to him. Any man will open his heart to the gospel. God will get to him. Don't you forget that. I heard Dr. Bingham, the founder of the Sudan Interior Mission, tell this story years ago in seminary. Amazing story. He told about a young African chief, and I think it was in the Congo, that uh, he found a page out of the Gospel of John, it was in English, and he could not read English, but there were those in his tribe who made trips to the coast who could read English, and they read it to him. He said, I'd sure like to know about that God. You mean to tell me there's a God that loves us? Never heard that before. Who could we get to tell us about a God that loves us? And he says, I tell you what you do. You go out to the coast and go down to a certain city and see if you can find out anybody that can tell you about that God. And uh, two native runners were sent. And they came to the coast, started down the coast. They had that page out of the the New Testament out of the Gospel of John. As they went down the coast, it just happened there was a missionary going to Africa, and word came to the ship he was on that the Johannesburg, other ports were quarantined, there was a plague, and they, the ship would not put in but would go on to India. He said, I, I'm, I'm going to Africa. He says, could you put me off on the coast? Well, they said, that's a pretty bold thing to do. He said, that's all right. I'm called to go to Africa. Must be some reason. Just put me off on the coast. They put uh, his trunk and put him in a little boat, and they sent him with a couple of sailors to the shore, put him out there, and they came back, and the ship took off. And there sat this fellow on his trunk. And he prayed, Lord, you call me to go to Africa as a missionary? 
here I am and I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. By that time, these two natives were coming down the, the, uh, the coast, down the beach. They came up to him and they said, uh, we got a page here out of a book, and uh, can you read it? And he looked at it, he says, sure can. He says, do you know anything about that God? He says, that's the reason I came to Africa, to tell you about that God. So they took his trunk and took him, took him back into the tribe. Dr. Bingham said that that was a tribe that had the thing that was closest to Pentecost in the sense thousands were brought to a saving knowledge of Christ. There is not an open mind and heart anywhere. God won't reach out and touch them. And there's not a child of God that'll do God's will, but what God will reveal that will to him. You want the Holy Spirit. Do you know the reason that God stopped Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road? One who hated him, one who persecuted him, one who's the greatest enemy that the church has ever had. Listen to Paul. Paul says, when he appeared to me, showed me who he was, he turns to Agrippa and says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And any man that'll not be disobedient, he'll find out God's will for his life. God says he will. Our trouble is we have our own plans made. And we've already brought our own ticket. And we're asking God to approve it. And he doesn't do that. He'll never do that. We must want the Holy Spirit in our lives. The third and the last. Witness in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just now come to the day of Pentecost. What really happened? Will you listen carefully now? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Where was that place? Well, two places have been picked out. One's that upper room. I personally do not think they were there. We just assume that because that's where they met for prayer. Where were they? They were in a public place. Where would be the public place these men would go to? To the temple. And those at the temple witnessed something that had not been seen since the days of Solomon. The coming of Shekinah glory. Not into a holy of holies, but into the hearts of frail, feeble men. That's Pentecost. Let's move on. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. It was not a wind. It was like a wind. It was appealing to the ear gate, because that's the only way you and I will never know anything. It's through our ear gate and through our eye gate. And then we read, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. This is not the baptism of fire that you hear so many say took place at Pentecost. The baptism of fire is judgment. That's yet to come. We're seeing that in the book of Revelation. When the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, far from heaven. That, my friend, is baptism of fire. And if man will not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they must have the other. What you have here is not fire. But it's like it's a fire. It appeals to the eye gate, you see. Now will you notice the most remarkable thing of all that is here. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Were they baptized with the Holy Spirit? Will you listen to me carefully? This is probably the most important thing you can say in Southern California today. There's no place that's as wild theologically as our area on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Now will you listen? Were they baptized? It does not say so. It says they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now somebody says, but don't you think that they were baptized? I know they were. But you see, the only thing that's recorded is the experience that they had, and nobody experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It happened, but it's not an experience. 
He baptized him. And you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit until you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the only experience they had on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they began to speak. That's the only thing that happened. And that's the only injunction given to us. Nowhere will you find any command for any believer to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The minute you trust Christ, you're baptized, you're identified with Christ, put in the body of believers, you have nothing to do with that. You're not asked to do anything about it. You don't even have to know that. But my beloved, you and I are commanded, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is something that after the day of Pentecost was repeated again and again for these men because you need constant filling. These men now filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter can stand up and preach in the power of the Spirit. These men can begin to move out and the church starts to the end of the earth. And the only day that it ever bogged down was when men went forth not filled with the Holy Spirit. Will you listen how many times, and I took the trouble yesterday to go through and see several of the places in the book of Acts where men were filled with the Holy Spirit after Pentecost. In Acts 4, 8, Peter's before the Sanhedrin. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. And then in the same chapter, verse 31, The early church now, persecution is set in. How are they going to withstand it? Well, they go to God and and prayer, and it's the grandest prayer of all. They didn't say remove persecution. They said just give us boldness. That's all we ask for. And here is what happened. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And then we find that concerning Paul the Apostle in Acts 9, 17, And Ananias went his way, entered into the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and listen, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He wasn't baptized. He was out on the Damascus Road. When he trusted Christ, he was baptized. How do you know? That's not an experience. But here he has an experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And now this man, Paul, is able to move out for God. You find constantly in his ministry, in Acts 13, 9, Then Saul, who's called Paul, Filled with the Holy Ghost on his first missionary journey, he needed a fresh infilling for the first convert that he ever made. Must be done by spirit-filled believers. And writing to the Philippians as an old man, Paul says in Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God, filled with the fruits of righteousness. Fruits of righteousness is the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul is talking here now about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and that was the prayer of the Apostle Paul for these believers. There is power today in waiting. There is purpose today in wanting. There is God's program today in witnessing, for that is his program. May I say this in closing? Doing Christian work, going through Christian acts, performing Christian exercises, just making motions. You may just be a religious zombie, that's all. There is a filling of the Holy Spirit that is essential for any service that God can and must honor. The Bible is a dead book unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Prayer is meaningless without a filling of the Holy Spirit. And Christ himself will become ashes and dead men's bones unless the Spirit of God fills you, my beloved. I have a clipping here that comes from the first book I wrote on Romans. And listen to her letter. I've returned to California after a year of full-time Christian service 
in Ohio and an extended trip east. But I've come back almost spiritually shipwrecked, have been a Christian for three and one and a half years, and until recently was able to give a glowing testimony about being saved out of unity. But lately I've been so dead that Christ seems way up there and I'm way down here. I have all the negative virtues of a Christian. I don't smoke, drink, play cards, tend movies, use makeup. But those things do not make a happy Christian. My friends tell me I'm becoming bitter. And oh, I don't want that to happen. Before becoming a Christian, I was very ambitious, worked hard for whatever I believed in, and incidentally was listed in who's who. But now I wonder what's the use. The world is going from bad to worse. Everything is heading for disaster. The only hope is to wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the matter with that believer? Not filled with the Holy Spirit. Need another filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Are you here today? You can be regenerated. You can be indwelt. You can be baptized by the Spirit of God, and you're still not ready for service. We can go forth like Samson did. Samson went forth after he got his hair cut. There was no strength in his hair. The strength was in the Holy Spirit. He wist not that the Spirit was departed from him. God have mercy on us. It can happen to us today. We can so toy and play with evil until there does come a time when the Holy Spirit is grieved and we're going forth in our own strength. Stephen said to the Sanhedrin, a religious body, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you. I'm a, I have news for you today. I'm a Pentecostal. <laughs> I do not believe that you seek for the Holy Spirit and you seek for the baptism. I believe today that if you and I are going to do anything for God, we must have a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. May he give us that in the days that lie ahead. Oh, how this poor preacher needs it. How you need it. How all of God's children need it today. Dr. McGee asks a good question. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Or do you need a new filling of the Spirit? He explains more what this means in the book Through His Spirit, which is available in our online bookstore at ttb.org forward slash shop or by calling 1-800-652-4253. And here's the big surprise. All of Dr. McGee's topical books, like Through His Spirit and more than a dozen more, are just $5 each while supplies last. You know, this is basically the cost of getting the book to you. Also on sale are all of Dr. McGee's paperback commentaries and his slimline Bible at a special price of two for $10, one to keep and one to give away. If we can help you find the best resource for you, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or email us at BibleBus at ttb.org or just visit the site, ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz for the whole Through the Bible family. We're praying that the precious Spirit of God will fill you with His grace, mercy, and peace as you walk with the Lord today. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world. 